Good You're evening. Up, My name is Linda Gorski, and I'm the president of the Houston Archaeological Society. And I want to invite you, I want to welcome you to our meeting okay. tonight, uh, featuring a program by professional archaeologist Doug Boyd entitled Blacksmithing on the Texas Frontier Historic Archaeology at the Tom, Tom Cook Blacksmith Shop on the Chisholm Trail in Bolivar, Denton County, Texas. Boyd's presentation will begin with a discussion of the site's location on the Chisholm Trail. Although it lasted only two decades from 1867 to 1886, the Chisholm Trail era is steeped in cowboy and cattle drive history, folklore, and mythology. The trail's route through Texas is known, but little research has been conducted on the towns and businesses that sprung up in support of this short-lived industry. One of the most important businesses along the Chisholm Trail and in any frontier town was the blacksmith shop. Blacksmithing was an essential service in rural areas and good blacksmiths generally became prominent members of their communities. This program will look at the 2020 through 2021 archeological and historical investigations of the Tom Cook Blacksmith Shop, an archeological site located in Bolivar, a small town along the Chisholm Trail route in Western Denton County. The site is especially significant because Thomas Cook Sr. was an African-American freedman who owned and operated his own blacksmith shop. He worked as a blacksmith in Bolivar from the 1870s until his death in 1898. Tom Cook was not only a successful blacksmith, but he was also a minister, a Freemason, and a respected member of the Bolivar community. The work was sponsored and funded by the Texas Department of Transportation. It was a collaborative project and has incorporated archival research, descendant community outreach, oral history research, and archaeological investigations. As many of you know, Doug Boyd is a senior archaeologist with Cox McLean Environmental Consulting, now Stantec in Austin. He has a BA from West Texas State University and an MA from Texas A&M University. He has been doing archaeology mostly in Texas for over 45 years. For most of this time, he has served as a project archaeologist, project manor, or manager, or principal investigator on hundreds of cultural resource management projects. I would like to introduce you to Doug Boyd. Thank you, Linda. And I'd like to say a big thank you to all my friends and colleagues at the Houston Archaeological Society. You're a wonderful group to work with. And I appreciate being invited to come and talk about uh, the, the Tom Cook Blacksmith Shop uh, on this uh, African American History Month. And I apologize, I have the date wrong. It is the 17th, not the February 10th, as it says there. Okay, now my. Okay. Um, the Black History Week actually got started in 1926, uh, but it was a very small um, historical um, event. And uh, it wasn't until 1976 that the United States government officially uh, made February Black History Month. And there's an amazing website that you can go to that's uh, contributed to by the Library of Congress, Smithsonian, National Park Service, and a lot of other groups, has some really amazing resources on African American history. So it's fitting that we're talking tonight about Tom Cook Sr., a freed, freedman blacksmith who lived in Denton County in the late 19th century. So that's what we're going to be looking at. This is a, a statue that's not very far from you guys. This is over at the Houston Astros ballpark, and it is a statue called Forging the Future. And blacksmithing has always been uh, symbolic of strength and power. Uh, people who can heat up hot iron and meld it into and mold it into different shapes and create things uh, have always been uh, recognized as, as uh, special people who have uh, an amazing skill. And so the whole concept of blacksmithing as, as uh, symbolic of power is, is very important, I think. It's so uh, ingrained in, in the imagery that the United States Futures Command, which was established in 2018, uses the, the anvil as its symbol. And their logo is Forge the Future. So that uh, is a kind of a testament to the, the symbolic power of, of uh, blacksmithing. And for tonight, we're going to talk just a little bit about the Textot Road Project. 
um, and the collaborative, what we're calling the Bolivar Archaeological Project, the collaborative nature of our work, a little history on the Chisholm Trail, then we'll get into some history of Tom Cook, the blacksmith, and, and other aspects of his life and his family uh, there in Bolivar. And then we will talk about the archaeology of the Tom Cook blacksmith shop, uh, looking at the features and, and how we're reconstructing the site and what happened there. Uh, we'll look at some of the artifacts and interpretations of those artifacts. And then we'll end with a, an overview of some blacksmith archaeology and history in Texas. So this is a map of uh, Denton County, and we're looking at the town of Sanger over on the right, and over about four miles uh, west of Sanger on Farm to Market 455 is the town of Bolivar. Uh, Bolivar used to be a bigger place. Um, it's uh, a cluster of houses. There is a, a Bolivar store there, but it's closed down, and there's not a lot there right now. Uh, but it, uh, a long time ago in the Chisholm Trail days, this was a hopping little town with uh, multiple hotels, uh, saloons, a uh, black, couple blacksmith shops, and a lot of, a lot of uh, activity going on. So the Textot Road project is widening of the farm to market uh, 455, and it uh, is being widened all the way from Sanger to uh, Bolivar. And the Texas Department of Transportation had three sites that were um, on their radar uh, that were discovered. These sites were tested, uh, and two of them went to data recovery, data recovery, and that is the Sarton Hotel and the Tom Cook site. And so uh, we're going to focus in on the Tom Cook site, which was uh, south of 455 and uh, on the east side of Farm to Market 2450, so at that major intersection. And it, it, there's no doubt that this road needs to be widened. When we were working out there, uh, the traffic on 455 is, is amazingly high and, and a, a very uh, da dangerous road, uh, as narrow it is, as it is. So they are in the process of, of widening it now. So this is a very collaborative project and there's a lot of people to thank and I'm not gonna go into all the different names here. I would like to recognize Kevin Hanselka as our TxDOT project manager. And uh, it's been wonderful to work with. And, and a lot of the folks at TxDOT have been doing public outreach for us. Um, we have a lot of different collaborators uh, coming from different um, areas, and I'll be mentioning some of them. Uh, and of course, the North Texas Archaeological Society uh, came out and, and large numbers and volunteered while we were in the field and worked with us, and that was wonderful. And I would like to recognize the property owners, Dave and Elise Kurtzinger, uh, who owned the Tom Cook blacksmith shop, and they also still own the portion of the site that's outside TxDOT's right of way, but they allowed us to continue our excavations beyond the edge of the state-owned right of way to get a little bit more of the site um, information. So thanks to those folks. So we, our collaborative project is really a, a blend of historical archaeology, archival research, and community outreach and oral history. If you just do one of these activities, you don't really get the full picture of a site like the Tom Cook Blacksmith site. But when you blend all of them, the stories are so much richer and you get so much better information and, and more interpretable information. And that's our goal is to tell as, as rich a story about Tom Cook and, and the activities that went on there and his family not only at the time he was there, but following his family all the way up to today. So for the, the road improvement project, uh, Amaterra Environmental did some work there in 2016 and 2019. They did the original survey and the testing of the site. Cox McLean, now part of Santec, uh, we were brought in in 2020 and 2021 to do the data recovery we were there in the, the cold months uh, of, of those years, um, and we worked on both the Sarton Hotel and the uh, Tom Cook site. We did remote sensing surveys, archaeological excavations, intensive archival research, and descendant community outreach. And we are continuing uh, all of the archival research, the artifact analysis, and, and uh, data analysis, and the oral history work is, is ongoing right now. 
Uh, Amy Days is our uh, lead historian. And Amy didn't have to start from scratch because we got a lot of great information from Kim Cupid, uh, who's the Denton County uh, um, Museum person with the Office of History and Culture. She provided us with a lot of amazing uh, document. In fact, it was her research. Uh, we didn't have to go look for the descendants of Tom Cook. She already knew who they were, and we just picked up phone numbers and, and called them up. Uh, and also, thanks to Waldo Trell with TechDot, he had also done a lot of uh, research on Bolivar and on the site uh, as this project was unfolding and, and shared all of that with us. But Amy has continued all of this work, um, the research, and you'll be seeing some of her findings. So a little bit about Tom Cook. He was born in either 1826 or 1840. You can take your, your choice. Uh, there's two different sources uh, for that information and we'll see those. Uh, he arrives in Tarrant County by 1857 and he came from South Carolina. So he was still enslaved when he was brought to Texas. He is, shows up in Denton County by 1872 and we know that he's working as a blacksmith in Bolivar in 1880. Presumably, he's working as a blacksmith uh, as soon as he shows up in 1872, but that we have not confirmed yet. But also in 1882, he purchases a, a lot, uh, one of the town lots in Bolivar, and that becomes uh, his blacksmith shop. But there was uh, improvements on that lot before, and we're pretty sure that the blacksmith shop was already in operation uh, in the 1870s. Uh, Tom Cook was a Methodist minister. He got involved in, in civil rights movement uh, in his time. He was a founding member and a senior warden of the Masonic Joppa Lodge number 62 in Denton. That um, Mason Masonic Lodge is still active. Uh, he was a worthy patron for the Eastern Star, which is the women's auxiliary uh, for the Masons. And he was a mentor to Fred Moore, who was a civil rights leader and an educator in Denton County, um, very famous person there in Denton County. And Tom Cook died before the turn of the century. He died on January 5th uh, in 1898. And I love this photo on the right, but that is not Tom Cook. And we do not have a photo of Tom Cook. Uh, there may be some out there, but the family hasn't been able to find any yet. And, and we haven't stumbled onto them. Uh, we're still looking. This is the 1880 census, and you see Tom Cook's name appears at the top as the head of household. Um, in this 1880 census, he says he is 40 years old, which puts him born about 1840. Uh, um, and it says he's a blacksmith. His wife is Lathea, and then it lists all of his children. And one of the children down there is Kitty, uh, third one from the bottom, and Kitty is the descendant who uh, we have found the the her descendants living in Denton and uh, involved them in the project and, and a lot of this information that got us started came from Kim Cupid and here's a out of the manufacturer schedule for the U.S. Uh, 1880 census for precinct five Denton County the same same place uh, and. This shows that there were two blacksmiths in uh, Denton or in Bolivar at that time. One is Tom Cook and one is Ennis Mensel. And Ennis, uh, the capital, which is the more or less the value of the shop, Ennis's shop is worth $100. Tom Cook's is only worth $20. So Ennis presumably had a larger shop that may have employed more, more blacksmiths. And Tom, uh, as far as we know, uh, only worked there by himself uh, or maybe had one, one apprentice. At, uh, we still don't know a lot about how Tom's blacksmith shop actually worked, but we archaeologically, we think it's a pretty small shop, which would be typical of a rural uh, place like Bolivar. Tom is mentioned in an 1890 state gazetteer, and uh, he, he shows up as uh, T. Cook, blacksmith. Uh, this is just one of the, the records that we have. Um, there really aren't very many uh, primary records like this of, of Tom Cook. So I'm kind of go through and show you a few of them. But uh, 
there is a reminiscence. Mo most of what we know about Tom Cook is, is things that are written later. And this is a reminiscence of the late Ben Bentley. Um, this was about 1958 and it was published in 1965. But he said that the first blacksmith shop, in, talking about Bolivar, was owned by Tom Cook, a colored Methodist preacher. So this is a, second, uh, a secondary account because uh, Bentley didn't know Tom Cook, as far as we know, uh, but he had heard about Tom Cook and knew about his blacksmith shop. So this is more typical of the kinds of, of uh, things that we find uh, for Tom Cook. Here's a couple more. This is one from uh, J.M. Wade. Uh, and this one actually is someone who would have known Tom Cook. And uh, it was published uh, years later. But it says, in 1871, we had a Negro who was a blacksmith and a barber at Bolivar. His name was Tom. We would shoe our cow horses, and then we would get up on the anvil, and he would shave us. So that's a, kind of an odd mix, I think. <laughs> it helps you understand a little bit about Tom Cook. He's, he's the jack of all trades. Uh, the, the bottom one is from a 1918 publication. And in this uh, particular history and reminiscence of Denton County, uh, Bates lists all of the, what he called the best citizens who would never fail to answer the roll call in a time of danger. And he lists all of the citizens. There's 135 who are listed. They're not specifically mentioned as being white. But then at the bottom, he then lists the colored role of those same people. Uh, and there's 11 people listed, but one of them is Tom Cook. But what this is telling us is that Tom Cook was a well-respected uh, citizen in Bolivar by uh, everyone. Um, Here's a big unknown that we want to find out more about. When, in 1882, uh, a man named James Barweiss sells the, the lot in Bolivar to Tom Cook. Barweiss was a blacksmith. He was English, um, and we don't know anything about him. So that's one of the things that Amy Dace is researching now. Um, but the deed records list a storehouse as being on the property when he sold it. and. Uh, when Barweiss, he owned the property in 1880 uh, that would be sold to Tom Cook, but Barweiss wasn't living there in 1880. In 1880, he was living up in Cook County, Texas. So in 1880, Barweiss and his sons were blacksmiths in a different county. So I think that there is a relationship between Tom Cook and that Tom Cook was already the blacksmith at this location. Um, that's something we hope to be able to prove but Barweiss is not there for a lot of this time. And in 1882, when he actually sells the property to Tom Cook, Barweiss is over in Montague County. So we've got to find out more about that. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to, to find the records and it won't remain a mystery. Um, we are really, really pleased to have Dr. Maria Franklin from the University of Texas at Austin working with us on this project. Um, she is a nationally recognized historical archaeologist, specializes in African diaspora studies and in race and gender studies. And for this project, she is doing our descendant community outreach and engagement. And it's been absolutely marvelous. Um, and the, what, what the little uh, document on the left is, is a newsletter. So while we were in the field, uh, on our Fridays when we would head back, I would uh, call Maria or text her uh, images and, and, and uh, information about what had happened that week. And she would put out this series of newsletters uh, for the, the African-American community to keep them engaged and, and get them involved in what was going on uh, with the Tom Cook blacksmith shop. And so this is just one way that she has discovered that uh, really brings the community in uh, and makes it an, an amazing project. And so in this photograph, I want to introduce you to um, Howard Clark. He's the big guy over there in the, in the plaid jacket on the right. Um, and that is his family. And they are direct descendants of Tom Cook. So when we first found out uh, the names of some of the people, Maria talked to Howard Clark. Um, and, and, you know, he knew of Tom Cook, uh, but he didn't know much about Tom Cook. 
And so we got to talking with Howard and we actually asked him to join our, our crew if he would. Uh, he came out and worked with us when we started vegetation clearing in November of, of 2020. Uh, and he ended up becoming a, an archeological crew member and working with us in the field 100% of the time. And it was really amazing to have Tom Cook descendant uh, there with us when we were excavating on the Tom Cook blacksmith shop. And so this is a, an exciting part of what we're doing. And Maria has done oral histories with all of uh, these folks and we're continuing that work at this point. So a little bit about the Chisholm Trail. The Chisholm Trail gets a lot of attention in Western history. It's, it's kind of the classic uh, trail, cattle trail that people think of, but it really had a short life, only from 1867, the very first cattle drive in 1867, to 1886. Once the railroad comes into this part of Central Texas and, and it over by I-35 and Sanger, the, the Chisholm Trail dies overnight. People can take their cattle uh, over and put them on a railroad car in Sanger and ship them anywhere in the country so they don't have to drive them all the way up to Kansas to get them there. So here is the National Park Service uh, publication 2010, uh, which talks about the Chisholm Trail and the Great Western Trail. These are the two trails that the National Park Service recognizes as the primary trails for driving cattle out of Texas up through Oklahoma and, and into Kansas or Nebraska. And uh, the, the Chisholm Trail ended up in Abilene, Kansas at the railhead there. And so they were driving cattle a long way if you were coming from South Texas. Um, and it went right through Denton County. And I love this um, lithograph of uh, the, the people on uh, the first drive in 1867, uh, Colonel Wheeler's uh, trip uh, going up to the Kansas Pacific Railway. Um, I think this is probably fairly accurate and that the cattle were probably longhorn cows like that. Um, I don't know about the, the cowboys there. A couple of them look like they have sombreros on. Uh, at this time, it, it's interesting that there is quite a few uh, black cowboys who were involved with the, these early cattle drives. And we'll see some of that in a minute. Um, this is a, an amazing photograph uh, by Erwin Smith, who did photography capturing the last of the, the, the Western days. Um, and in this photograph, what I want you to think about is all of the travelers on the Chisholm Trail, riding horses, driving cattle, several wagons, they would have had supply wagons, a chuck wagon. Every wagon had a ton of harnesses on it and, and uh, for the horses and the wagon parts itself. And so we're gonna see some of that and think about all of the wear and tear that all of this stuff got in a, a long, long trip and the need for blacksmith all along the way. So if you look at, at just these drawings of some of the horse tack and harness hardware, uh, on the left, you see that there's there's a, at least a minimum of 12 iron parts on a horse bridle. Uh, on the full harness uh, of the horse, not including the wagon, there's at least 48 uh, or more iron parts. And all of these things were getting hard wear and tear. And any time any of them broke, you had to have a replacement. Uh, and if you had major problems, you had to go run and get a blacksmith to fix them. The same thing with a uh, chuck wagon or, or a, a, a wagon hauling gear. Uh, these wagons saw a lot of hard, hard uh, life. Oh, I'm gonna try and, ah, I missed that one, sorry. But there's over 250 uh, iron parts on a, a typical chuck wagon. So uh, if a wagon wheel broke, you were, you were stuck until you could take that wagon wheel off, take it into the nearest town and find a blacksmith and, and get it fixed and then take it back out and put it on your wagon. So this was a big deal having blacksmith in small towns all along the Chisholm Trail. This is Howard Clark's uh, family tree and Tom Cook Sr. and Lathea Perry are up at the top. And then it shows several generations to get down to Howard Clark down at the bottom. And Howard's Aunt Betty, Betty Kimball, 
uh, is the uh, matriarch of the family, and she's the keeper of, of the knowledge. And she is absolutely amazing and uh, knew uh, a lot about uh, the family. And, and uh, Howard knew, knew quite a bit himself. But one of the things that he didn't know was that uh, Tom Cook was a blacksmith. Uh, and it, it uh, was interesting because very early on, we, we learned that Howard's hobby uh, was forging knives, knife blades. And he didn't know that his ancestor had been a blacksmith, but he was doing that. So we kind of think that's a, a, a neat little connection there that uh, there, there's something spiritual going on uh, connecting him that way. Um, when we were working out there, we uh, had found in the find a grave, the, the grave of Tom Cook. It's in a small cemetery called the Knox Cemetery, north of Bolivar. Uh, but it was kind of hidden away on private land. So we, uh, Howard and I started uh, asking around, found out who the landowner was, and we set up a time when we could go and visit his grave. The family had never been to the to his grave out in this small cemetery. Uh, it turns out it's actually a pretty big cemetery, and there's probably a lot of unmarked graves out there. Uh, but I got to go with um, Howard and his daughter, Haley Wright, and and be there the day that they visited Tom Cook's gravesite for the first time, and that was a real privilege for me, uh, and a, a, just an amazing event. And this is where the date 1826 comes in for the birth date of Tom Cook. So we don't know whether the headstone is is wrong or the census record is wrong, but um, that that's quite a span, 1826 or 1840. Uh, one of the Tom Cook descendants is a man named Jack Cook, who died in 1948, um, and he was a resident of Quakertown. So this gives us a connection between the Tom Cook family in Bolivar and the Quakertown African-American community in Denton. We know that uh, Jack Cook lived there. I think there were other family members who lived there as well. Uh, but Jack Cook, uh, interestingly, uh, worked as a stableman for the, the Women's College, which is now the Texas Women's University. And this photograph, uh, we don't know the date of it, but it probably was taken at, at the stable where he worked um, at the, that Women's University. And uh, Jack is buried at the Oakwood Cemetery in Denton. So the Tom Cook Blacksmith Shop. We have uh, not completed the archival research. We are really kind of in, in still in early stages. We've done uh, a, a fair amount, but every time you dig into the archives, you get more questions and you get answers. And so we're we're chasing all of that out. But we know from a number of different records that Tom Cook's original lot in Bolivar was 100 feet long and 54 feet wide. Uh, and we also know that blacksmith site archaeology is, is rare in Texas. Uh, there's not a lot to compare with. And I'll show you the, the couple that are, have been investigated. And as far as we know, this is the only site of an African-American blacksmith shop that has ever been investigated in, in Texas archaeologically. Uh, this is the initial excavations at the site by um, Amaterra archaeologists. The yellow is the one by one unit and the green blocks were their backhoe trenches. But where we ended up working was all of the area around all of uh, this that had not been excavated before. And we actually worked uh, further out into here uh, and over into this private land over here. And Amaterra and in their initial uh, testing, they collected 2,315 artifacts. The vast majority were iron, metal, uh, horseshoes, nails, broken items, scrap iron. Um, we're still in the process of, of washing and cataloging all of our artifacts. Uh, we are going to be uh, somewhere 25,000 artifacts before it's all done. Uh, that's a guesstimate, but I think that'll be fa fairly accurate. So this is a shot of the blacksmith shop uh, before in 2019, before uh, Amaterra did anything at the site. And the little arrow points to a historic marker. This marks the Bolivar town site. Uh, Texas Historical Commission uh, subject marker uh, commemorating the, the founding and the importance of the town of Bolivar. And it's interesting that when they put this 
uh, marker in, they had no idea that they were digging into a historic place to, uh, to pour the cement and set this marker. But you'll see this marker in a number of the photographs. Uh, one of the first things we did is ground penetrating radar. And we had uh, Dr. Chet Walker come out and he ran ground penetrating radar and magnetometer over both of the sites. Uh, and we got some interesting results. The, for the most part, both of them just showed us that there was a lot of artifacts scattered all over the place and a lot going on. In this one, we are looking at uh, the ground penetrating radar survey. And what we see here is something that we didn't know until after the fact was a, a deeply buried, uh, pretty good sized water line that comes through here. And, and so that's what most of this is. Some of this we attributed to debris out in the borrow ditch. And we thought that this was debris in the borrow ditch up in this corner, the upper left corner. But it turns out that that was a cultural feature. That turned out to be a significant structure that we'll see. So now a little bit about blacksmithing. So when we talk about a rural blacksmith, a one-man blacksmith shop, you had everything you needed close by. So what we're looking at here in this photograph is a forge. This one is a uh, portable metal forge, was purchased from some manufacturer. Uh, these things could be found in Sears and Roebuck catalogs and Montgomery Ward catalogs. You could get them from a variety of places. So they're down here, there's a blower that pumps up air. This is the, the forge box where all of the coal or charcoal is put in for the fuel. And that's the vent hood to take the smoke out. So you heat up your iron in the forge. You turn around, you put it on your anvil, and you hammer it while it's red hot. And then this is your quenching tub right over here. And that's where you cool it off. And so all you have to do is go back and forth one or two steps between these stations to, to, to do most of your work. Uh, there also would have been in the shop a workbench. Uh, this is a little vice that he would have to be able to hold things down if he was, if was hammering them on, on them but needed a vice rather than the anvil. Um, there would be a fuel storage area. It looks like there's probably some coal down in here that's close by, so he can grab it very easily and throw it into the, the forge. A tool storage area. Looks like he's got some more tools stored over here. Uh, and then a waste disposal area uh, or a stockpile. Here you can see some horseshoes and iron chain links and other things. This, this is raw material. He could reach down and grab one of these and, and pick it up and use it very easily. And then outside the shop, there would be more of those kinds of areas. And there also would have been a domestic area because a blacksmith was a businessman and they would have had a place where they could sit down a couple chairs, maybe pour a cup of coffee and, and talk with somebody about uh, what they needed. Uh, what, what do you need fixed on your wagon or, or on your horses? So this is kind of the layout of a one man shop. And that's what we think is a good model for the Tom Cook shop. Now, in, in terms of what Tom was using as fuel, uh, we know that he was using coal at least part of the time. And coal, when it's heated up, it turns to coke. Okay, so you drive off some of the impurities and it becomes coke. And coke is what gives you the really hot fire that you're after if you're a blacksmith. So coke is the main fuel that they were, they were seeking. So they would heat the coal as it got to the coke stage then they would cluster it all together and use it to heat the iron. When, when it drives off and burns away everything, it leaves behind the silica impurities that are in all coals, and they're called clinker or slag. The better the quality of the coal, the less clinker or slag you'll produce when you fire it. The, if it's poor grade, it's gonna have a lot of clinker and slag, a lot of, a lot of silicate materials that come out. And the, we learn to recognize these materials and they're present uh, in, in the site in a lot of areas, but not quite in the quantities that we would have expected. And we'll come back to that, to that topic. We also looked at this stuff that we call hammer scale. And what hammer scale is, is each time a piece of hot iron is hit on an anvil with a hammer and sparks fly off, those sparks are pieces of metal, okay? And they collect on the floor of the blacksmith shop, whether it's a wooden floor or a dirt floor, and we suspect that Tom Cook probably had a dirt floor shop, um, and we see that consistently. So when when we 
studied, started studying the blacksmithing, we kept running across this hammer scale and, and how to uh, gather it in an archeological context and study it. So that's what we, we did. And we systematically sampled all of the soil uh, everywhere we were digging uh, and every one by one, we would take five samples, one from a center and one from near each of the corners of the, the unit. And the way we would tell uh, the depth to take our samples of where the concentrations were is every excavator had these little magnets, these very powerful magnets, and we would uh, run them over the soil as we were digging. And we quickly learned uh, where the concentrations were. And here's a nice little short video to show you what hammer scale is. So every little piece of what we would, we wouldn't even recognize it as anything. Uh, it looks like little dirt clod, but it is tiny pieces of hammer scale and flake metal that have come off of blacksmithing and they're just collected in, in the soil. So archeologists have, Archaeologists have studied hammer scale and they've learned a lot of different things about it. Um, and it can tell you a lot about the blacksmith and what the blacksmith was doing. Uh, spherical versus flake uh, or platy hammer scale can tell you about the quality of the iron that was being worked. Uh, the, the, the heating, the uh, temperatures that the blacksmith was getting to. The concentrations of different kinds of hammer scale that are found in an archaeological site can be very informative. I am fairly ignorant of what all you can learn and how in depth you can get with this, uh, but we're we're learning more about it and and trying to figure out how we want to analyze our sample. But at a at one level, just knowing the quantity of hammer scale systematically across all of our excavation units is is an important thing because it's going to tell us where the blacksmith shop was. And that's we'll come back to that in a minute. And one of the other fortunate things is that early on, Maria Franklin uh, got in touch with Kelly Kring. And Kelly Kring is a blacksmith uh, up in North Texas. Um, and he's got a lot of experience. And he came out and, and volunteered to just come out and spend the day with us. And, and uh, he, he gave us impromptu lessons for the crew and whoever was there visiting. Uh, and it was eye opening to experience the, the blacksmithing artifacts and, and what we were digging up from the perspective of a blacksmith. And we pretty quickly learned that, hey, this guy's gonna be our consultant when we're analyzing our artifacts because he's, he's a very important guy to, to tell us about that. So Kelly has 30 years of experience in blacksmithing. He has his own business uh, in blacksmithing called Hot Off the Anvil. Uh, he is, has done replica work for uh, museums and, and uh, historical sites, uh, uh, blacksmithing artifacts that are on display all over, and he teaches blacksmithing classes at Brookhaven College. So we were really pleased that uh, he helped us out, and he has started coming to our office now and, and looking at our artifacts with us in the lab, and we're learning a lot more from him, and we'll see some of that as we go along. So now I'm going to jump forward and give you the spatial layout of our uh, site and what's going on. So what we have is a dugout at the, the closest to the corner where the, the intersection of the roads are. We'll look at this feature. It's a, a very interesting feature. I believe this dugout is the, the storehouse that was mentioned in the 1882 deed record when the property was sold from Bar Weiss to Tom Cook. Uh, this is where we think the blacksmith shop is, uh, and it's because of our concentrations of hammer scale and, and other evidence. Over in this area, we find very few artifacts, but what we do find tended to be uh, things related to uh, horseshoeing, ferrying activities, farrier activities. Uh, and this is probably where Tom Cook was shoeing the horses and maybe had a corral. And then there's a waste disposal area. This is primarily the area where uh, Amaterra excavated. So we're going to look at some of these a little bit more closely. Um, and it is interesting that the blacksmiths in rural areas were almost always making horseshoes and they were usually the people who were shoeing the horses. Uh, this is this uh, is very, very typical of, of rural blacksmiths. Um, 
And it's interesting that the blacksmith also became the first veterinarian. They were the guys who really knew horses. They could correct uh, some problems with horses' gaits by putting thicker or thinner shoes on different feet. So they, they became the guys who, were, uh, who understood horse health. Um, this is a view of the Tom Cook blacksmith shop, um, kind of midway in the excavation. You'll note the uh, Bolivar historical marker right in the thick of it. And so the areas we're going to look at are, that is where we think the blacksmith shop uh, was. We think it was a, uh, a wooden structure uh, at ground level with a dirt floor. And then in front of us is the rock pile inside what you see are, are walls appearing. Uh, the, these are, are the walls of a dugout structure and all of this pile in the middle has been pushed into uh, that structure. So we, we excavated out a massive amount. This would be a couple small truckload of rock out of this area. We believe most of this rock came from the, the other wall that you don't see, that it, it was pushed in Probably when they did some of the early road work at this intersection, they filled in this structure. The upper part of the, the rubble has some more recent artifacts in it, but when you get down into the thick of the rock pile, it tends to all be uh, blacksmithing related artifacts. When you get below the rock pile, it's very, very different. There's, there's different kinds of artifacts. So here's some of our evidence for the blacksmith shop itself. So when we were uh, using our magnets, it told us where the hammer scale was concentrated. And in this photo, we have a dividing line about midway in the photo. You see to the right, it's homogenous and there's no little uh, inclusions. To the left, it's, it's modeled. There's white caliche, uh, there's black coal fragments, uh, and there's this whole modeled surface where this clay is out of place. This clay was brought in to this location and it's probably from deeper in the profile, may have even been from over around the dugout floor, uh, digging into that floor to get a little more clay. But somebody probably tried to prepare a little bit of a floor in here. Um, and this is where our hammer scale is absolutely concentrated. It just drops off quickly right in here. Even though we didn't find post holes or any definite evidence of the walls of the blacksmith shop. This is probably one of the walls of the shop right in the middle of this photograph. So this is looking back towards the uh, rock pile when we first started excavating it. And we've only excavated one little, about a meter wide trench and about three meters long. And there's the pile of rocks that came out of it. And this is just a small portion of the rock pile that we ended up moving out of that but we left the walls in place as we realized that they were, they were intact. And here's another view of that trench and you can see uh, the wall uh, is very nicely faced rock, uh, stacked very uh, neatly. Uh, there was a lot of effort went into digging this dugout, uh, leaving a bench and then uh, putting the rock all along the, the walls of this. So um, I'm not sure exactly why they, uh, they rocked it up, but it would have been uh, a very substantial structure. Okay, and so in this view, we see what we believe are uh, the approximate limits of uh, the, the rock dugout, rock wall dugout, which was probably the storehouse, originally built as a storehouse by Barweiss. Um, and one of our hypotheses is uh, that this was a, used as a living quarters, as the house, by Tom Cook and his family, at least for a short period of time. And I'll, I'll show you why we think that. And this thing is fairly small. It'd only be about 16 by 16 or maybe 18 by 18. Um, unfortunately, the, the wall to the north is pretty much destroyed by the, the um, borrow ditch out here. And we lost the wall coming to the uh, west side uh, in the foreground uh, look at the other borrow ditch. So these were the only two intact walls that we had. Okay, here's the view of uh, the structure again. And the, the back to the rock pile, 
uh, all of this rock pile in here, we, for the most part, it was unburned limestone rocks, some really big slabs that we know came from the wall. But mixed in with this, there were smaller uh, rocks that were uh, burned and had in evidence of intensive heating, discoloration, and we didn't know why. And so we thought one possibility is that they might have been a, a rock forge that was up in the blacksmith shop that got bladed away and pushed into this pit as well. Uh, but eventually we ruled this out as a, as a likely scenario because when you have the rock forge, really the only rocks that ever get any heat are a few right on the very edge uh, and not most of these rocks would never get any heat at all. And we had a lot more than that. Uh, we had a lot more heated rocks than you would expect in a small forge like this. So we suspect that, that uh, the heated rocks in there may have been from a, a rock chimney that was in one part of the dugout, but it got destroyed when the dugout got uh, bladed into itself. So one of the things that we wonder is if Tom Cook didn't have a manufactured forge like the one we saw in that, that photograph. And here's a couple out of the Sears and Roebuck 1902 catalog. Um, these kind of forges would have been uh, very easy to transport. If Tom Cook needed to pack up his forge and some coal and, and go out and uh, go to a site to fix a wagon, uh, he could do that. So uh, this is a, a possibility, and a lot of the, the rural blacksmiths, excuse me, the rural blacksmiths use portable forges. Now, in terms of what happened in the dugout uh, before the rubble gets put into it, the, the middle zone there is what we called our floor zone, and it is typical of a, a, a cumulative floor zone in a structure. There's a lot of cultural material in it. Uh, there's a lot of charcoal and ash mixed in with this stuff, but no hammer scale, zero, none. We tried it everywhere and it just wasn't in there. We took samples uh, and there's also no, not any blacksmithing artifacts in that floor zone and there's no coal to speak of and no clinker to speak of. Well, I'll show you one, one piece of clinker that came from that bottom layer. And then inside this structure, the very bottom in a few places we had uh, the bottom floor layer was a two or two or three inch thick layer of, of uh, ash. Looks like may have been intentional, uh, perhaps to, to keep moisture from coming up uh, through the, the clay floor. Okay, so in this photograph, we see the dugout is uh, almost completely excavated. Uh, we could not excavate this portion here because we see a standing telephone pole. Uh, we couldn't risk destabilizing uh, the, the active electrical pole there, so we had to leave a, a buffer around that, but we excavated everything else that, that you see in here. Uh, this is before it was all gone. We're just down to the last little bit of floor zone in some areas. But interestingly, we found three posts. Uh, these are large post holes. The ones in blue are the posts that we know were there. The ones in yellow are post locations that I hypothesized had to have been there but they were blown out. One was literally blown out by the highway sign right here that the, uh, the uh, farm to market road signs are on. It went right in the location where there should have been another post. So if it was, it was there, it got obliterated. And this other one was just beyond this post and it also got obliterated. But these three were, were absolutely intact and in place. And this one is on a corner. This one is on a corner. And this one is in the middle of the structure. There wasn't one back here, but I suspect that this had an A-frame roof. Uh, these posts were, were big and it probably had a sod roof. So this was a substantial dugout structure uh, with uh, a, a significant amount of attention paid to these large post holes. This is just one of the post holes. We're looking down on it. You can see the, the discoloration of the stain there. I suspect that these poles at some point uh, when the structure was abandoned, got ripped out, uh, they, that they got pulled out. If they may have been uh, used as firewood or something, but both of these post holes were filled in with uh, cultural debris and charcoal and rocks and things like that. And here's another view of the intact wall and uh, the, the ash layer right on the floor. No artifacts or anything below that ash layer. 
uh, and it was sporadic. It, it only covered a small portion of the, the dugout. Interestingly enough, this is a, a uh, TV cable. Uh, somebody came along the edge of the borrow ditch and trenched in and then hit all this rock. And they, but they dug the trench right through the wall uh, of this structure and then put it in there. So the whole time we were working in there, we, we had to jump back and forth over this cable so we wouldn't knock everybody's television out. <laughs> And this is the one fragment of clinker that we found in the floor zone of the dugout. And it's classic clinker. Uh, it's the, the debris from uh, heating. Uh, it's, the, it's the silica residue that's left over from heating coal. Uh, but it was a fifth size chunk. But what this one artifact does is it tells us that blacksmithing was indeed going on at the time that people were living in this dugout. This is probably something a kid picked up and brought in and you know who knows, but uh, it ended up in the, the floor zone of the dugout. Okay, now back to uh, interpreting the blacksmith shop through the eyes of a blacksmith. This is Kelly Cream on site with us and uh, he was there on, on this Saturday. We had uh, some of the North Texas Archaeological Society folks out there and Kelly immediately recognized this one artifact that we knew was something special, but we didn't know what it was. And he recognized it as a clinching tool. This would have been held in, in a uh, farrier's hand. When you drive the horseshoe nail through the horseshoe, you use that clinching tool as an anvil on the other side of the hoof, and it bends the nail when it comes out, and it, it clinches or bends that nail. And so this is what a clenched nail over on the bottom right would have looked like. And the uh, over on the right, top right is a series of different horseshoe nails. Most likely in looking at the horseshoe nails, we believe Tom Cook was, was buying uh, horseshoe nails in, in, in big lot uh, rather than making all of his nails. He could have done that, but that would have been very time consuming. And if he did a lot of horseshoeing, which we're pretty sure he did, uh, he would have liked to have had uh, pre-made nails. And we know that, he, that some of them are indeed uh, pre-made. So Kelly's now been coming up to our laboratory and uh, I, I will admit that he's correcting us on some of our misinterpretations. Uh, but the important thing is that we are learning an amazing amount from, from Kelly and we're learning to recognize the, the artifacts and the residue generated by the blacksmithing activities. And that's a very important thing. We'll look at a little bit of that. So one of the things that we did when Kelly came up is he arranged for us to go out to the Jordan Botman Pioneer Farm. We uh, met with Philip uh, Waters, who's a, also a blacksmith. Uh, and Philip uh, basically made things right in front of us and used the different tools so that we could see how the waste pieces of iron that were cut off, the things that Kelly calls drops. When a, when a blacksmith is working and he cuts off things that he doesn't want, he just lets them drop onto the ground. Those are drops, and but they're very important because they tell you what was being made. So we learned to recognize some of those things and, and we got to see them being made. And uh, we got to talk about the different kinds of blacksmithing tools and how they're used and how you would uh, take a, a straight hardy like this one over here, you would put it in the hardy hole here, and then you use that edge as your cutting edge, uh, and all these different kinds of hardy tools, the different kinds of hammers and, and tongs, uh, the different parts of an anvil. So it, it was really an amazing uh, education for a couple of dumb archaeologists. And we also got to talk a lot about steel and wrought iron and various qualities of, of iron. Uh, and how blacksmiths uh, think about that. Uh, we got to see firsthand being being produced, the, the, the coal turning to coke uh, down here and then to clinker. And the clinker we find in the ground is, is heavy. It's full of dirt. Uh, it, that heaviness is, is not the clinker because clinker comes out and it's very light and fluffy. So, you know, that was, that was kind of interesting. Uh, but we learned how uh, to look for these telltale signs. When a hole has been punched in iron by a blacksmith, it widens out the body of, of the uh, flat iron that it's punched into. This is the punch that was used. Uh, this one's a, called a drift because it's widest right here and it can be pushed all the way through the hole. Uh, and then we got to see lots and lots of different kinds of 
of the drops, the things that would fall down in the floor of the blacksmith shop and just get uh, kicked around and never picked up. And that's the kind of artifact assemblage that we're seeing and learning to interpret. One of the artifacts that we got at the uh, Tom Cook site is the tip of an ax blade. So what you're seeing is just the working bit edge of an ax blade. And this is a steel blade. And Kelly explained that blacksmiths, when they made uh, axes, they used steel and they used wrought iron. And I found this illustration online that shows exactly what he was talking about. So they start with wrought iron, they fold it, and they, they make it into uh, a little uh, wedge, and then they turn it over and they forge weld the steel blade to the wrought iron butt of the axe. So this is the hole where the, the uh, handle would go through, and this is the steel blade. So this is wrought iron and this is steel. So that's the weak point in an ax. Uh, in a forge ax, when it breaks, typically it will probably break along that forge weld between the wrought iron and the steel. But you wanted a sharp steel edge to hold that edge, but you wanted the wrought iron because it's not as rigid and it, it actually has some flex to it. Uh, for pounding on it and and for when you're when you're hammering with it, so even making an axe is a is a work of art uh, in a blacksmith shop. Uh, we had a variety of blacksmith tools. This is one of the hammer heads that we found. Uh, very classic blacksmith uh, hammer shape on this one. Here's a the end working end of the tongs. Uh, these either broke off or, as Kelly uh, suggests, they, the blacksmith, at some point, these may have gotten worn and, and the blacksmith needed uh, a piece of iron that just happened uh, to be the size and shape of these. And the blacksmith might have cut, cut the, um, the handles off and used them to make something else and just thrown this away and made him another set. These things were fairly easy to make. And, and so uh, a good blacksmith was always thinking, you know, what's the easiest way for me to get this job done? Okay, now back to the wagons and harnesses. Uh, again, think of how many things are, you know, 250 things or more on the wagon uh, and, and 48 on a single horse harness. So you're looking at a couple hundred on a four horse harness. So we found lots of different kinds of things. This is a bridle bit. Uh, this is a cinch ring of some kind. And these are bridle buckles or, or some kind of harness buckles. Uh, lots and lots of these things at, at the site. Um, we find a lot of the brass rivets that were used to hold the harnesses together. Uh, so we know that Tom Cook was working with horse gear and harness gear uh, at his shop. And we found uh, these things. Now, if you think about it, what Tom Cook made for the most part, isn't what we're finding at his shop. Most of the things that Tom Cook made walked off uh, with the, the client. They, they were driven off in a wagon or they were rode off on a horse. The things that were broken and brought in to be replaced is what we see discarded at Tom Cook's shop. So this is an example of that. This is a worn out uh, piece of, of harness hardware that would have been on a single tree or a whipple tree. Uh, this would have been the clip probably that went right about here. This is a wagon box wrench. We found the end of one of those. Um, these things were very, very important. And if, if your tool broke in the field, uh, you had to have a wagon box wrench. You just didn't, didn't go without it because you had to have that to take your wheels off. Um, one of the things we learned from Kelly is how important uh, the work of blacksmith was in, in wagon wheels and wheel rights uh, many, many blacksmiths specialized in, and were real wheelwrights, and we think Tom Cook was doing some of that as well. We found a number of items in our assemblage that are made with wagon wheel rims, and these are, are again, the, the drops, the bits and pieces that were cut off of a wagon wheel to resize it and, you, and make it into something else. And in fact, this one is a very amazing one because it's got these little teeth marks on it, uh, that show where it was put into a, a specialized uh, contraption where uh, it would have held the wagon wheel rim when it was hot 
when the blacksmith was tightening it up and, and reforging it to itself. And then the blacksmith would take the hot iron wheel and put it onto the wooden, uh, he would take the, the, the hot rim, put it onto the wooden wheel and let it cool off and it contracts and, and then clamps the wheel in place. So this was a, a very specialized type of blacksmithing. And we have evidence that Tom Cook was doing this. Uh, we found some of, of the tools that Tom Cook was using. Uh, this is the uh, part off of a monkey wrench. Uh, these things are, haven't changed all that much. Uh, you can buy similar wrenches today. Uh, lots of agricultural uh, pieces of equipment, and, and this thing was particularly abundant. Uh, we find the blades off of these little mowers and reapers, and uh, these were steel blades and uh, would have been reused by Tom and, and he would have kept them around, but he probably had to make a bunch of these to replace broken ones for, for uh, farmers in the area. Every um, small farm uh, would probably have a mower or a reaper because they would grow grass and then cut the grass to feed to the livestock. So the, these uh, blades that we were looking at are all along this mowing edge on this thing. This is the classic McCormick reaper. Uh, this is an interesting little artifact. This is uh, uh, a cotton bale tie, and uh, it matches very perfectly with a cotton bale patent from uh, 1861. This was uh, the the cotton bale had a a flexible hoop, and it was bent into two loops, and then they those loops were hooked around both sides of this cotton bale tie to clamp the uh, the band around it. And each cotton bale had about five of these bands that went around it. And the cotton gin was just about uh, 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 a long stone's throw, maybe a hundred yards across the road uh, from the blacksmith shop. So these things could have been uh, used as, as steel material by Tom, or maybe he had some other purpose for, for bringing them over. Uh, now let's take a look at some of the residential artifacts that were found. Uh, some in in the upper area around the dugout, but they were most concentrated in the dugout deposits. And that is, I believe, because the dugout was serving as a residence for a time. So here in this photograph, we have uh, classic crosser buttons, uh, hard rubber buttons, a white uh, ivory or, or ceramic dress button off of a, a woman's dress, uh, ceramic bead. Well, we'll see some, they had a lot of these. Uh, this is a graphite pencil that would have been used uh, to write on a slate uh, blackboard used by kids and probably used by Tom Cook in his blacksmith shop. And let's take a close look at this little artifact. That is, uh, it stamped on it that it was the George Bruckbauer, uh, it, was, it was a mouth harmonica. And we were able to very quickly identify this as a, a patented mouth harmonica in uh, 1874, but it was a Great Britain patent, not a US patent. Uh, and I thought it was the case of a harmonica, but uh, I learned that it was a cylindrical harmonica. I'd never heard of one of these, but the, the entire instrument was uh, in a form of a cylinder. And this is one of those Bruckbauer harmonicas. Uh, lots of kids artifacts, um, marbles of different kinds. So I like to think that, that Tom Cook's kids were playing around uh, the dugout and around the shop uh, and, and kids in that era, every site I've ever worked on from the late 19th century, if you dig enough, you're gonna find some kids' marbles. Uh, ceramics, we got an amazing array of different kinds of ceramics, uh, pretty typical of the uh, post-Civil War era. Um, the, the one down here with the red and blue on it, uh, the, we think it's a spongeware uh, of some kind. Uh, we found a number of different vessel forms that this is represented in. And I wonder if that wasn't the kind of the set of dishes that the Cook family used. And eventually a number of them got broken and scattered uh, in the site. One of my favorite little artifacts is a pocket knife because to me a pocket knife has a lot of it's a personal item uh, that pocket knife right there is mine that was handed down to me by my father uh, and i was using it uh, while i was in the field and i would be devastated if i lost it uh, because those were, were a very personal kind of thing and so 
uh, finding the pocket knife there at the blacksmith shop. So in Texas, there are really only two blacksmith shops that I've been able to find. Uh, you guys can scour the literature and help me find more. I would appreciate it. But I've only found two that have been uh, substantially excavated. And in both cases, uh, the, the Volrith shop in San Antonio on the left uh, was excavated uh, in 1988 by a uh, car archaeologist, uh, and it was in use about the same time period as Tom Cook's from 1874 to 1915. But it was uh, in pretty bad shape. It had been, the site had been really disturbed. So they got a lot of good artifacts, but they didn't get a lot of information on the blacksmith shop itself. On the right is a rural farmstead blacksmith shop uh, from Collins County, excavated in 1986-87. And it probably wasn't even uh, in existence until the 1930s. So it's a, a much different kind of thing. This would be the where a, a farmer uh, bought a blacksmithing uh, setup from Sears and Roebuck and, and was doing his own farm blacksmithing. So we'll take a quick look at African-American blacksmiths in the United States and Texas, and then we'll wrap this thing up. Um, so uh, there's a lot of evidence that blacksmiths uh, were common among the slave population in all across the South. So large numbers of, of African Americans uh, had blast, blacksmithing skills when emancipation happened. That gave them a, a marketable skill that they could go out and get a job with immediately. It gave them a skill where they could make money and save money and, and uh, very quickly become landowners. And I think we see a pattern of this uh, in Texas and across the, the South. Um, and uh, this is from an article called Black Owned Businesses in the South. And they're talking about uh, the fact that uh, the blacksmithing was one of the important uh, trades that, that uh, these folks had. Um, th this man, James Pennington, uh, at the national level is a very famous uh, abolitionist and uh, Presbyterian minister, but he was also a blacksmith. That was how he earned his living uh, when he started out. He was born on a plantation in Maryland. He apprenticed as a carpenter and a blacksmith. He escaped uh, from the plantation, uh, and then he became the first African-American to attend Yale University, and he published a couple books. The bottom one in 1849 is called The Fugitive Blacksmith. Uh, and it's his personal story. And I have, haven't gotten that book, but I'm, I intend to get that and, uh, and read it. I suspect that it's available uh, free online somewhere. Uh, one of my favorite articles was written by Richard Burns. It was called African-American Blacksmithing in East Texas. And here you see a couple of photographs of a blacksmith at work and then a, a horseshoer, blacksmith putting on a, a horseshoe and filing it down. Um, and this in, in particular, there was a lot of connection between mythical powers of blacksmiths in African tradition. Uh, and, and I think that kind of set the stage for uh, African Americans. There were, there were Africans who came, who were brought over as slaves, who immediately recognized the art of blacksmithing because they'd done it in their home country. So there is that connection. Uh, blacksmiths in Texas had a high social status. Regardless of your race, if you were a blacksmith, uh, that was an important deal. Uh, blacksmiths in the days of slavery were expected to make anything and everything of wrought iron, and they had a, a, a relatively high position on the plantation. The blacksmith always played an important role in frontier society. A blacksmith was an asset to his community. Uh, some blacksmiths focused on the practical, others focused on the aesthetic and made artwork. Uh, forging, being able to forge well was the true mark of, of, a, of a true blacksmith. And that's where archeologically you can tell the difference between uh, a farmer who is doing a little blacksmithing and a true blacksmith. Uh, and the fact that most blacksmiths were farriers and they became the first veterinarians uh, and that a blacksmith's tools were prized possessions. So one of the things that we don't find at uh, Tom Cook's side is his anvil, but that anvil had value and probably uh, was kept either sold by his family later on or, or given to another blacksmith. Um, a couple of interesting observations, one by Prince Carl of Solmes, the founder of New Braunfels. In 1845, when he visited Texas, 
he met an enslaved blacksmith named James who was on the Nassau plantation in Fayette County. This same blacksmith uh, was also encountered by uh, Ferdinand von Romer, who was traveling Texas studying geology and flora and fauna. And he was in 1885 at the Nassau plantation. And he also met the same blacksmith and was impressed by him. So this is the earliest example I know of, of uh, accounts of enslaved blacksmiths on plantations in Texas. And he stated that James was a, a, a very valuable Negro who among other accomplishments thoroughly understood the trade of blacksmith and could, who could easily have earned $3 a day at his trade. Several times he could have been sold for $2,000. And this is, you know, the, the kind of the, the inhumanity of slavery, but to a slave owner, the, the blacksmith was a valuable slave. Uh, a, a field worker might be worth $400, $500, but a blacksmith might be worth up to $2,000. So that, that those skills of, of people who were enslaved uh, were very, very important. Uh, coming to Texas, one of the famous blacksmiths who, who became a, a, a Texas legislator is Meshack Roberts. Uh, this is an amazing guy. Uh, he was enslaved in Arkansas, brought to Gilmer, Texas in 1844. Uh, upon emancipation, his former owner gave him some land near Marshall. Uh, in 1867, he almost was killed by uh, the KKK, uh, but in a, he survived and he went on to become elected to the Texas legislature in 1873. So this is an example of blacksmiths with skills becoming important uh, citizens. And I see this pattern over and over again uh, all across the South and, and in Texas. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these. Here's another guy, uh, Ulysses Cephas, uh, was a hist historic uh, blacksmith in uh, San Marcos became a respected community leader and a, and a church and band leader. Um, here's one, you guys should all recognize uh, this, uh, Joshua Houston, one of Sam Houston's slaves, started out as a blacksmith, uh, became a very wealthy businessman, a leader in Huntsville, a uh, founding member of the Union Church, uh, a first black alderman in, Walker, uh, in, in Huntsville and first uh, black Walker County commissioner. So, and this guy was appointed to the Republican National Convention in 1888. Again, we're seeing blacksmiths becoming important citizens. That pattern is, is uh, very real, I believe. Um, we haven't gotten into it yet uh, in a big way, but there's a, a lot of information to be gained from going through the Texas Runaway Slave Project information. This is just one that I found uh, where there was a $500 reward posted for uh, the recovery of a, a, an escaped slave uh, who got out of the Russ County Jail. He was a, a, a bright mulatto, meaning a light-colored mulatto, 22 years old, a blacksmith and a shoemaker by trade. Uh, and he, he had gotten away and, and they wanted him back. But this also gives us that link with uh, blacksmithing. Uh, and I think there's a lot of information that we can glean out of these records. Um, I haven't gotten into all the census record uh, information that I want. For instance, the, the records should show, uh, we should be able to tell how many African-American blacksmiths and, and fill in all of this information. But this one, I just wanted to show you real quickly to show you that across the United States, the big years for blacksmithing were 1890 to 1910, the largest numbers of uh, blacksmiths in the country. And interestingly enough, there were some female blacksmiths, very small numbers, but they were, they were there. Uh, and some of the records do show the number of blacksmiths by race, but I haven't been able to, to glean all of that out of it yet. Uh, but here is one from 1910 uh, where I was able to get that. So in 1910, Texas had 2,399 manufacturing businesses. 380 of those were blacksmith shops. That's 15 16% of all of the manufacturing in Texas was blacksmithing. And of all of the 1910 blacksmiths, uh, there were 9,727 uh, Negro blacksmiths. That's 4.8% of uh, the, the population. So that's a pretty amazing uh, number, I think. 
I suspect that this number may have been higher in the years right after emancipation. Um, Philip Simmons is probably the most famous uh, African-American blacksmith. A number of different books have been written about him. He lived in Charleston and he was called a world-class artisan blacksmith. So you need to look him up. He is absolutely amazing. And I think one of the famous 21st century blacksmiths is going to be Howard Clark, uh, the descendant of Tom Cook. He got so interested in this and when he met Kelly Kring, he decided to start taking Kelly Kring's blacksmithing classes. He's now uh, several classes into it, and Howard is becoming uh, a, an artist and a blacksmith, and I think that is just an amazing uh, end to this wonderful story. And, it, and it's not the end, it's, it's, it's a beginning, but it reconnects Howard with uh, his ancestor, uh, Tom Cook. So here's where we are, uh, and what we don't know, we still don't know a lot of things. When and where did Tom Cook learn his blacksmithing? We suspect he learned it as a slave, but we would like to be able to confirm that somehow. Uh, did Tom Cook work as a blacksmith in Tarrant County before he came to Denton County? We'd like to know a little bit more about that. And what was the relationship between the English blacksmith, James Barwise, uh, with Tom Cook? So those are the things that we're gonna be looking at. If you guys have any comments on anything I've uh, said uh, or, or any thoughts or, or ideas, uh, there's my email, uh, please, uh, send me uh, some information and uh, we will end with that and I will stop sharing my screen and we can take questions. And I apologize for rambling on for so long. Doug, that was absolutely fantastic. Oh my gosh. We loved working with you at Frosttown so much and I wish we'd been able to work on this Volver project with you. Oh. It was incredible. Does does anybody have any questions for Doug or any comments? And I haven't been looking at anything in chat, so. Okay, Liz, are you still on? I'm on. There are no questions currently in the chat. All right. Anybody have any questions? Speak up. Well, uh, I've two, two, two things I'd like to mention real quick, though. Uh, one, and I don't know if um, Michael uh, Amador is on with, uh, he's with TechStot. Uh, yeah, it looks like he's uh, been sitting in on the program. Um, and Michael is a uh, videographer and a film producer for TechStot. And uh, Michael uh, last year put together a five minute documentary film on the Bolivar archaeological project. Um, it, it hasn't been posted onto the text dot uh, beyond the road website, but Michael shared with me the link to it. And I will, I will find out from Michael if it's okay to share that link with all of you guys. I think it's, they're going to end up putting it on the beyond the road uh, and making it available to the public. But if, if I can, I'll let you send that link out to uh, all of the membership uh, so they can watch that. A really good film, Michael. Um, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yep. Hello. Uh, actually, I actually turned my camera off. Do you think? <laughs> yeah, uh, I enjoyed you your good. presentation, Doug. I learned. I learned more every time. I every time you talk, I learn more and more. This is like oh, a right. rabbit hole. I mean, I got involved. It was just supposed to be a one day shoot. I go out there, take a few pictures. Then I started talking to Doug, and I started. Thanks, my camera's not working. Um, and then it turned into this little project, and I. I'll, Doug, you're well. If you have the link, uh, go ahead and send it out um, okay. to, the, to, to these people. I mean, it's going to be published soon. On the, I, I just got, I've been busy, so I, I need to tell them to publish it on YouTube. Well, <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's a fun little story, and I don't know. It might, I was, it got, it got shown at the at the Black Film Festival here, and didn't. Yeah, I didn't get the, I didn't get the attend live, but because um, it was virtual, I was really kind of disappointed. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we're, yeah. <clears throat> I'm thinking about doing a little bit. Um, we and Doug are talking about doing because I still had your walking through the thing and talking. I'm, I'm thinking about making it a little bit longer. Maybe I'll enter it in the Blue Line Festival and didn't see if I can get oh, some wow. in there. I don't know when that festival is. It's probably next coming up soon. I can't remember. Well, if, you, if one of you can send me the link, we can put it in a newsletter or send it out to the membership because I think yeah, they'd I'll, really I'll, enjoy I'll it. I'll send that to you tonight and then you can send it right. out to everybody. Yeah, and, I, and it's a, it's a, I'll make sure that that link's, it, it, 
it expires about every two, about every three weeks. So I'll make sure I, I'll figure out a way to make it extend longer okay. so y'all can watch Great. it, but it will expire in about a month. It's a really nice, nice, nice little film. So thank you, Michael. Oh, thank you. It was, it was fun. And thank you, Michael. Doug. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. It was terrific. We always learn something from Doug. Well, if there are no other questions, um, we there's, will. Yeah. Linda, there's, there's a few in the chat. Okay. Uh, okay. Kelly Crean had asked, I don't know if you can hear me with my yeah. interference, but Kelly Crean had asked uh, whether you would care to explain why there aren't more finished works found at the sites. So I, I just touched on that a little bit. And so most of the things that Tom Cook was making, you know, if, if Tom Cook uh, made a, a horseshoe and put it on a horse, then his product went off with the horse. So, uh, you know, we wouldn't see Tom Cook's finished product. What we would see is the horseshoe and the broken nails that came off of the horseshoe that he took off. The same with wagon parts and agricultural equipment parts. Um, one of the interesting things uh, is that we talked about the possibility. We've got a lot of iron artifacts over at the Sarton Hotel well. Uh, that's our Sarton Hotel site across the street. And we wonder if the Sarton Hotel might not have had some things that were made by Tom Cook uh, incorporated into the hotel. So that's something that we're looking closely for is if there's blacksmith made uh, forged items over there. Uh, but for the most part, what we see is, is the residue from the blacksmithing activities and not so much the finished products uh, of that. We see bits and pieces that he cut off and, and left behind. Uh, and we see his raw stock materials and things that he was salvaging and saving to use. Um, but, but as far as finished products, um, you, you really wouldn't expect them to be found in, in the shop. So, and, and I do wanna definitely thank Kelly for all his participation. Uh, he's gonna be doing a lot more consulting with us uh, and helping us with our uh, artifact identification, and it has been just a, a tremendous uh, collaboration with Kelly. So thank you very much. Uh, there's a question, where was Tom Cook a minister? Was it near the blacksmith shop? That's also a good question. Uh, we do not have the answer to that yet. Um, and I suspect it had to have been in Bolivar uh, at a, a small church or maybe over in Sanger. Sanger was only four miles away um, and, and there were African-Americans uh, over there. So um, it, 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 it's possible that it's either Bolivar or Sanger, but I really don't think it would have been uh, as far away as Denton. I, I don't think he would have gone that far. Let's see. Okay. Are there more questions? Uh, this is Jeff Mills. I have one comment. When I was five yep. years old, I, I, I lived in a house above a blacksmith shop. So a lot of stuff that Doug was talking about today brought back memories of all the work because I used to sit, stand around and watch the blacksmith shoeing the horses and preparing all, all the, the shoes for the horses and putting them on and the hot, hot putting a hot shoe on the horse is, is wow. quite... Uh, effect you know <laughs> and then nice. cutting, cutting the metal and, and 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 the fire and everything so it all brings back all those memories from when i was five years old oh that's so did cool. you happen to take any pictures no. <laughs> <laughs> hey jeff you camera. need to tell us all about that on on saturday <laughs> that's a, that sounds like a great story yeah. <laughs> i was only five i've, I've, I've slept Doesn't since matter. <laughs> whatever you whatever you remember <laughs> Okay, that's all I have. Okay, gang. Any other questions or comments? No. I want to. I really want to thank everybody for being at the meeting tonight, and especially um, Doug for giving us such a great presentation. Yeah. I recognize a couple of the artifacts that you showed, including uh, the cotton bale tie. I know we've seen those in other in other sites and I'm not sure we recognize what they were. So that's every time we see your here, you, you give us something new. So thank well, you guys very much. You're and welcome. And we'll, we'll see you next month.
and email me anybody has any any thoughts suggestions uh, uh ideas about anything i'd love to hear from you thank you guys all right thanks doug good night everybody good night, thank you bye linda bye,